Well, thank you for having us. And uh, I'm just curious how many people in the room have Parkinson's. I know Norm does. Yeah. Yeah. Know somebody with Parkinson's disease? Yeah. Well, I, I was first diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2011. And I've been uh, fighting it ever since. So I swing from one on off, on to off period. So if I sound a little bizarre, I uh, have to ask you for forgiveness. I'm going to ask Darlene to read my written introduction. And then we're going to open up the floor to all sorts of questions that you might have. Before I get started, uh, when I pulled into Minidosa, it, I went back in time, I, it, at age 53, I attended a kayak race on the lake here, never been in a kayak before. For his son, his, his eight-year-old son, uh, not my son, uh, this is well before I met him, uh, was uh, racing. Just oh, I, I've never been in a kayak race, and I, where my son was representing South Carolina in in points uh, championship. Uh, so the parents uh, from South came to me and asked me if I ever kayaked before. Of course, I never have. And they talked me into kayaking down this lake. Took me eight minutes. <laughs> Plus, a little wobbly, and the finisher, the winner, finished it in a minute and 40 seconds. <laughs> we did get the point. We won the championship, and that's my memory of Minidosa. <laughs> I went on to uh, train in kayaking and competed worldwide as a result. So Minidosa brings back good memories. So I'll ask Darlene to... Well, and I'll just add to Steve's, uh, uh, that was, uh, I was not part of Steve's life back then, but I've heard this story, and uh, Steve went on uh, for the next 10, 12 years uh, getting into master's kayaking, and uh, so he has Minidosa to thank for that. Uh, he had a wonderful uh, career in uh, kayaking. So uh, it is nice to be back where he started. But we'd also we'd like to thank you all for being here, and we'd like to thank Lisa Wilkowski for the invitation, and uh, Karen Syntac. Okay, <laughs> sorry, uh, Karen and Stephen Syntac and his wife Kim. Stephen uh, is born and ra born and raised here in Minnedosa, and is also the reason that, that we are here. Uh, so we're just thrilled to be sharing uh, our adventure and Steve's uh, project for Parkinson Canada. So what uh, we thought we would do, and, and you'll also have to excuse me, we weren't, ex we weren't expecting to speak today. So, <laughs> uh, so with your... If you've ever driven down a Canadian road, you probably didn't have to go too far before you spotted a derelict car or truck sitting in a field, a swamp, or some abandoned junkyard. Seeing these cars through the eyes of a car enthusiast or a collector, a photographer, a historian, or simply someone with a sentimental sensibility, it is easy to be captivated by these forgotten relics. There is just something mysterious about these nostalgic wonders. They all have a story to tell, and they speak differently to everyone. To me, these old vehicles are a testament to our past, our history of innovation, 
and the revolutions born of it. To be sure, the automobile has had a singular impact on society. Entire industries were built around this technological marvel, and many infrastructures were developed to support it. In more ways than one, the automobile revolutionized the world, giving us the ability and the means to be mobile. Products and services were put within reach and communities became more interconnected with one another. In this way, the creation of the automobile made the world smaller, more accessible, and at the same time greatly expanded our horizons. To me, the automobile is a triumph of the human spirit and its drive to create and connect. It's really no surprise then that this deep-seated love I have always had for cars would come to intersect with another nearly lifelong interest of mine, the art of photography. <coughs> Fully retired, with nothing to do, especially in the face of the COVID pandemic, I decided that I needed to find a way to occupy my time. I had been a hobbyist photographer for 50 years, but those projects had always taken a back seat to other interests in more recent years. It was my partner, Darlene, who suggested that I pick up my camera and start taking pictures again. It didn't take much. My enthusiasm for capturing images of those forgotten vehicles was very much alive. The truth, however, is that this return to my much-loved hobby was more than a passion project to fill a temporary void. It was a matter of doing something, anything, for the sake of my health. This question of what to do now was one with which I had been forced to grapple many times. At this point in my life, I had been living with Parkinson's disease for the past 10 years. That diagnosis, more than a decade ago, in the spring of 2011, had sent me reeling. What do I do now? I had thought incessantly. It had been a difficult question with which to come to terms, seemingly impossible at the time. My life had always been filled with sport, action, and adventure. <coughs> I had always had a competitive spirit and a drive to challenge myself and succeed to the best of my abilities. My love of competition and my enthusiasm for cars had led me to my first avocation, semi-professional race car driving. For 20 years, I'm just adding to this, for 20 years, Steve w raced cars across Canada and even tried to, uh, to qualify for the Indianapolis 500. Race car driving had then been followed by wilderness and adventure canoeing, marathon kayaking, which you spoke of earlier, racing, even a short-lived attempt at hang gliding. The year before my diagnosis, in fact, I had just fulfilled a lifelong dream of learning to sail, purchasing a 31-foot sailboat named Cloud. My neurologist told me that sailing along with other things, would no longer be an option. <coughs> I had to disagree. I couldn't imagine my life any other way. I did not want to let the disease define me. And if I was going to stay the course, as we say in sailing terms, I was going to have to change my tack. What to do now quickly became no matter what. No matter what, now it was a matter of continuing to make my dreams a reality while still facing this relentless disease. Never knowing what symptom would rear its ugly head next, I learned to adapt and change constantly. Mental and physical fitness became the greatest tools I had as I tried to build a new life. Over the next few years, I enrolled in countless courses to arm myself with the knowledge required to navigate the large bodies of water I hoped to sail. And I used my years of athletic training to build strength and agility. Since sailing is 
dependent on warmer weather, the off-season provided me an opportunity to focus on my physical training. By 2015, I had found myself immersed in bodybuilding. I was inspired by its transformative process, and after much encouragement from those in the sport, I entered my first Manitoba Amateur Bodybuilding Association competition. Over two years, I placed second and fifth in the master's group category and won an award as the most inspirational competitor. Feeling as if I was making some headway, both personally and for my cause, I was eager to begin looking forward to my next challenge, sailing the Great Lakes. A longtime entrepreneur, I retired in 2018 and created Sail On with Parkinson's, a fundraiser for Parkinson Canada that involved sailing the Great Lakes to raise awareness of the disease as well as the continuing possibilities of living with it. The summer of 2018, Darlene and I sailed Lake Superior and Lake Huron. In 2019, we sailed Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, a total of 2,916 kilometers over two summers. The end of 2019 saw us <coughs> both honored by Sail Manitoba with their Sailor of the Year Award. It had been a rewarding journey in more ways than one. The onset of COVID-19 canceled our 2020 plans to revisit the Great Lakes. Suddenly, there I was, once again wondering what to do now. By the spring of 2020, reality had hit me in the head. New symptoms had begun to emerge, and my range and speed of mo movement became more limited. I had trepidations about my ability to continue to sail safely, both for myself and for Darlene. As hard as it was for both of us, I decided to sell Cloud. Now, just as I was faced with a new challenge, I decided to push myself again, to change my thoughts and my, my reality from what to do now to no matter what. I just needed to shift gears. So, in the fall of 2020, I decided to take short excursions, driving up and down Manitoba's back roads to find abandoned vehicles to photograph. It wasn't difficult to find the subject matter. The prairies are peppered with these hidden gems. On one of my earliest trips, I happened upon an 80-year-old Ford coupe, abandoned in the bush. As I was looking through the camera's viewfinder, I suddenly realized how fortunate I was to have the opportunity to see this vehicle in a decaying state reminded me that I was capturing a snapshot in time. Suddenly I was driven to wrest these relics from the dust and to showcase them as an attestation not only to our past and progression, but to our humanity, to ourselves. Vanishing Wheels was born. So taking advantage of the winter months of 2021, <coughs> Darlene and I began planning a photo expedition along the back roads of the Canadian prairies from Winnipeg to the Alberta foothills. There was a big question weighing on my mind. How do we find these abandoned vehicles? How do we contact the owners? Driving up and down dirt roads all day wasn't an option. In the dense foliage of summer, the chances of even seeing a vehicle tucked behind a barn, sitting in deep grass, thick shrubs, or some Saskatchewan coulee would be nearly impossible. So we decided to develop leads by contacting car clubs, using the local, local knowledge of body shops, and relying on plain old word of mouth. Turns out this was the right decision. <coughs> After we obtained our initial leads, our contact list grew exponentially. Darlene and I made connections with private collectors, car clubs, museums, antique and vintage salvage yards, family farms, car enthusiasts, 
and locals who just knew the whereabouts of abandoned vehicles. We headed out in June of 2021. During that summer, we drove more than 15,000 kilometers, visited countless communities, and experienced the Canadian prairies in their purest form. In a nod to this purity of place and the authenticity of the journey itself, coming upon these vehicles as found objects, found art, I elected to forego the staging that is often a part of the art of photography. The images you will see in this book are of vehicles just as we found them. The only artistic license I took was that for many of the vehicles, uh, we returned to photograph them during the golden hour, which is the hour just before sunset when the light is warmer and more diffuse, revealing the natural beauty of the landscape. This decision lengthened the journey, but I felt that in some ways I owed these old treasures my time. And there was something special about photographing them, themselves once part of a golden era, and now in their own golden years, in this golden hour, just as the sun was about to set upon them. Throughout our expedition, Darlene and I discovered the locations of hundreds of vintage and classic vehicles sitting in barns and fields. We experienced some unforeseen challenges too. Forest fires, smoke, extreme heat, fog, severe thunderstorms, and even a near miss with a tornado just outside of Regina not to mention the four tires we had to replace. During some of our photo shoots, we found ourselves having to bushwhack through heavy underbrush just to get to the vehicle. On one memorable occasion, Darlene had to keep watch for bears while I focused on taking photos. <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> At another time, we had to contend with a herd of bison. The photo shoots inside barns and outbuildings were no less precarious. Having to climb over debris of every description could be dangerous at times and could have ended our trip. Each trial was another snapshot of our Canadian prairies. A sometimes unforgiving landscape yielding an undeniable beauty. Despite of it all, because of it all, we carried on no matter what. We had set out to photograph these forgotten vehicles in the natural settings that had, perhaps, become their final resting place, to showcase them as a testament to our past, to our progression, our humanity, and ourselves. But having experienced the adventure, we discovered much more. We learned of our own perseverance, we connected with people and places, made new friends, and formed lasting bonds. We heard, in their own words, of the special connection with various vehicles people had, the myriad wonderful ways in which these vanishing wheels speak to them. And lastly, our eyes were opened to how tremendous this country really is how much she has to offer. This illustrated book depicts our adventurous photo journey across Western Canada to capture images of these vanishing wheels before they completely disappear from our landscape. And that is the introduction to vanishing wheels. And I would, I would just like to end with Steve's dedication. I dedicate this book to all those living with Parkinson's disease, their caregivers, Parkinson's support groups, the medical professionals, and the scientific community working so diligently to better understand this disease. So thank you all for being here and supporting us in this. And with this, we'd be happy to 
answer questions <laughs> of any kind. <laughs> Please, we just uh, welcome you to come up and look at the book and, uh, uh, and purchase the book or <laughs> whatever you would like. But uh, you're welcome to grab some coffee and a cookie and meal yes. and just chat if that's what you prefer to do. Yes, uh, whatever. Yeah. Well, Steve, what was does, one of your favorite anybody... books? Or sorry, what was one of your favorite vehicles to photograph? Oh, that's a that's a tough question. <laughs> All of them. They all had stories. Yeah. One story wasn't any better than the other story, but I'll give you an example. The front cover. Yeah. Go ahead. The front cover is a perfect example of why. And I have Steve is so creative. He's the creative one. I uh, uh, I I couldn't do this to save my life. Once he had the idea and took the first photos, he came up with the, with the name Vanishing Wheels immediately, before we even had most of the photos. This photo was taken in Weyburn, Saskatchewan. At, at, it was the second last uh, uh, stop on our way back, the, so it was September of 2021. And the owner of this vehicle, uh, and the vehicle is a 1949 or a 1950 Morris Cowley truck. The, uh, we had to take this photo then because, unfortunately, the owner was having this truck towed away for salvage a week later. But we found out from him the following summer, after we had chosen this as the cover photo, that the barn blew down that winter in a winter storm. So this entire scene has vanished. And, you know, there are so many uh, stories like that. Uh, um, Steve during, just loves all of the photos. It's a, a tough question to answer. During our summer trip, I took 9,000 images. Oh. Oh, and had to choose. <laughs> Did you ever come across a vehicle that you had a hard time identifying? Some of them, there's not much left of them. <laughs> yes, uh, there was. Look at that. The McLaughlin. Oh, there's the McLaughlin. 1917. That's a lot of you have, there were a couple, but uh, Steve did a lot of research. Looking at the Tug Hope. Yeah, the yeah. Tug Hope. Uh, <laughs> in most cases, um, we wouldn't take a photo without the uh, authorization of, okay. the, of the owners. Okay. So the, re the really um, old ones, uh, the owners would give us some, inf sure. some starting information, but we sure. found even there, they weren't always <laughs> right. So Steve mm -hmm. used the magic of Google a lot, and he would, he would take his phone, his photograph, and then he would start Googling uh, and match up what he could see from photos on Google uh, with with the various uh, you know the grills and, and the he's the car thing, guy. The only thing left on the Tud Hope was the hubcap. Yeah, that's and, how. And, and, and Tud Hope. Tud Hope okay. was, yeah. was in a um, was in a um, carriage company out of Viridi, Ontario. That in, at, the, at the dawn of the um, uh, automotive industry, there were well over 2,000 manufacturers. Mm -hmm. By 1920, they were down to 200, and then it dwindled down. <laughs> and uh, so, was, I, yeah, so. Uh, I contacted the uh, Tut Hope family in Aurelia, uh -huh. the museum in Aurelia. And we started comparing parts and photos, and that's uh, we did more research. It took us longer to do the research on the vehicles than it did to take the pictures. <laughs> yeah, and I should say, not we. Steve did all the research. The gentleman at the back has a question. I'm just curious, how often did you encounter a situation where the owner of the vehicle wanted you to buy it? 
<laughs> not at all. Not at all. No. No. And uh, but speaking of that, I I have to share this story with you. On page, uh, we got an email. Uh, you can. Uh, we have a website and uh, an email address, info at Vanishing Wheels. We got an, uh, an email about three, four weeks ago uh, to info at Vanishing Wheels, and it was just from a young woman. She, uh, she gave us her name and uh, uh, phone. She said, I just bought your book for my father for his birthday. And um, uh, we're, our family is from, uh, from Austin, and I would suggest that maybe you also come out to the Austin Thresherman's reunion to show, to so, okay, great. So, I, uh, so we started uh, e emailing back and forth, and it was a, a week or so later, uh, she sent me some information. Um, and so I was in touch with the museum, in the Ag Manitoba Ag Museum in, in Austin, because they coordinate the Thresherman's reunion. About two weeks after that, I get a call. Now, the young woman's name was Erin Klim Massey. Two weeks after my making contact with the Ag Museum in Austin, we get another call, because I had shared my, our phone number with Erin when she s sent us this suggestion, from Barry Klim, the, the dad who <laughs> received the book as his birthday gift. And he said, I love the book, but even more, as I was paging through it, on page 100, this truck was our family oh. truck. Where did you find it? <laughs> we want to buy it back. Well, we, we don't, I said, we'll contact the current owner and see if he's willing to get, uh, for us to give you his contact information, which we did, and he said, well, yes, I'm sure, I'll, I'll talk to them. So. Uh, we put uh, 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 we put Mr. Clem Barry Clem in touch with the current owner who and uh, the Clems uh, Barry Clem lives now in Beausjour and this picture was taken just outside of uh, for those who are French it's Richer Manitoba but all of the rest the rest of us call it richer <laughs> uh, in the white in the white yeah Apparently the next day after they got missed negotiations, and I'm, I think I've been told that he is going to buy his family truck back <laughs> and show it at the car show at the Thresherman's reunion, which they have asked us to come out to. So, I mean, talk about stories, but yeah. also what are the chances that something like that would happen? It's, it was just, it was amazing. 20% of the photos in the book no longer exist. Yeah. They've oh. been hauled, so many of them have been, been hauled away. away as salvage. Sure. The municipalities are getting after uh -huh. the owner. Um, families kept them to eventually restore, but didn't restore them. And just sold them off. I'm sure met all of you, uh, assuming you're, you're all car lovers of some sort, so you're probably familiar with uh, that unfortunate uh, happening. So. Any other questions? or? Well, please. So at, at, at any point, did you just get overwhelmed and think that this, this was not going to happen, or was your drive just so much that you felt you, you were going to make this happen? At any, any time, did you ever feel, you know? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm going to run out of steam or run out of time or that this wasn't going to happen? Yeah. Parkinson's is a relentless disease. Yes, I know. And uh, I tell people I live in a two-hour cycle. I take medication, the medication starts working, but wears off. 
So I have a two hour window in between. And to function life in that two hour cycle mm -hmm. is very difficult. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's what kind of popped into my mind because I mean, Norm does the same thing. You try, try and accomplish those tasks in, the, in those two hour. Mm -hmm. It doesn't leave a whole lot of time in the day for being very productive. Well, and that's the, the way we took these photos. I, um, I, I don't know if it, Cameron, I don't think we are really clarified in the introduction, but what we did is we have a motorhome. We have a 38 foot bus motorhome. So we took, it was the motorhome that we took, and we had a trailer with our escape uh, behind it. So we would take the motorhome, park for a week in one spot and then and then drive the the escape because <laughs> you don't take a motorhome or an RV <laughs> down some of these country roads. But that also, uh, to answer your question, helped us pace ourselves because we could always just come back to... And get out of the heat or get yeah, out of the elements. Just come back to the motorhome and it was also, it was our uh, schedule, you know, there was no time pressure. The one, what, Two good things about being retired during, well, one good thing about COVID was we were retired and we had all the time. Uh, so that, I think that, you know, we dealt with it. Plus, um, it, it, two years ago, Steve was... Uh, yes, two years makes a big difference. Two years makes a big difference, yeah. Yeah. It was, he still, he had a little more energy uh, still mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. uh, but. It's always a it's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. When we had scheduled it, my my photographs were either five o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. six o'clock in the morning, seven. Mm -hmm. One of Darlene's favorite times. <laughs> I am not a morning person. I, I like those sunset pictures. <laughs> we, or we take pictures in during sunset or the golden hour, or the yeah. blue hour. Mm -hmm. I very seldom took pictures during the day, right. in yeah. the middle of the day, because the lighting isn't good. Mm -hmm. And um, so yeah. it was, the way we did it, we spent part of the day uh, meeting people and getting leads and getting permission. Is, uh, you have to remember you're on private property, you don't own the cars, and mm -hmm. we don't own the property. We can't just go traipsing off into somebody's property and take pictures. Mm -hmm. So we always ask permission. We told we would advise them what we're doing. So we spent a good part of the day doing that, and then scheduling photo sh shoots. Mm -hmm. This one in Weyburn, the front cover, took us two photo shoots. Over two days. Over two days, and it took to, to get this picture probably took us, not including driving time from where we were headquartered, but just getting the camera set up and waiting for the right lighting took me three hours. Oh, good. <coughs> mm -hmm. So Darlene, did you learn a lot about photography? I sure did. <laughs> I learned nothing about photography. Uh, I learned what HDR is, high definition resolution. And for those who, like me, didn't know what that means, it's, it's uh, a method of, uh, you know, when you take a picture on your phone, you, know, you take a picture, but a professional camera, a professional, uh, he's now considered, He's never been a professional photographer in that he didn't do that to make a living. But we're told that because he has published a book, he is now, <laughs> he's now a professional. But um, the way he takes his photos is uh, on a tripod. And um, each one photo, when it's processed, is actually made up of five shots, the exact same image, taken five at five different uh, exposures. One overexposed, one underexposed, and I guess two over, two under, and one. And then, uh, and uh, the that's where, you know, when you do, particularly in the old days when we used to take our photos in to get processed, uh, what, uh, what the processors do with these professionals is uh, those five are literally 
put together and that's what makes these professional photos uh, give them more depth. They're, they're, they don't look flat the way you know my photos take mm -hmm. one photo taken on my iPhone. It, uh, so yeah, I learned a lot about uh, photography and I, I learned a lot from the feedback that other photographers gave Steve about you know the way he the angles he always takes the photos at angling up whereas so many people stand there and either take it straight on or, or down but uh, it's that all just those little things mm -hmm. okay. and I learned about the golden hour <laughs> that, that one hour, and it really does make a difference. The uh, the light. Steve the mentioned the blue hour. What's that? What's the blue hour? Blue hour. Oh, the, the blue hour is when the sun. If you if you might not see it tonight, but when the sun goes down, just below the horizon. Um, the the sky turns blue. If you go to the last one that we took uh, on our trip, what was that one? Oh, the, the, the one in Balgoni? Yes. I'll find it. So the golden hour is one hour before sunset, and the blue hour is the one hour after. As the sun, you the can sun still is, see, the sun is but set. the sun's actually set. The sun is set and what will cast a blue shot or a blue haze over top of the entire sky. And uh, well, I took one in the blue hour. I should. Yeah. Here it is, right here. Balgoni, Saskatchewan. Mm. And you can see it's. Uh, you can see the golden, but you can see the blue. And that's because this. So the sun had set, but. There's still sun, right? You know, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, and the sun is already set, but the, the way it was in the horizon, it cast uh, uh, light to the underside of the clouds, and the entire horizon color changes. And as you, as you, get later and the sun goes further down and starts getting darker, you can continue taking Moose pictures and you can get a fabulous uh, lighting on, on your subject. Lighting was really important. Yeah. And I guess it, the other thing to answer your question, what I learned is that uh, the way Steve takes his photos, um, so because of this uh, HDR and, and using the lighting, you'll you'll notice one of my favorite photos is, was taken in Indian Head, Saskatchewan, and I, I I initially called it the mangled mess because that's about all that was right here. So you asked me earlier how to mm -hmm. identify that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you see, this here was taken again at sunset. Uh, but because, because of the rust on, on the vehicles, because of his HDR technique, the rust, it almost looks like a painting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and we have people ask us, because uh, Steve has uh, created some posters for some of, some of these uh, individuals, and some people thought they were Paintings, mm. but it what it's it's the phot photography technique. Uh, the lighting, the lighting in your camera setting can pull, draw out the patina <coughs> in the car, and that's what I'm after. Mm -hmm. And you highlight the different greens and the mosses and the mm -hmm. dead grass and the patina in the car and the frost mm -hmm. in the windshield. Mm -hmm. Going back to your sailing, did you ever sail Lake Winnipeg? 
Yeah, that's where we, we started. That's where we started. <laughs> we started. Uh, we did the entire lake over and over again. Okay. Uh, have you sailed Lake Winnipeg? No. We, so his nephew sailed it when he was in grade 12 or something. Like that. We belonged to the sailing club there. Well, we were we were members of the uh, Gimli Yacht Club, uh, uh, and uh, actually that's even part of Steve's uh, Parkinson's story. We we, we bought. He bought, he bought the sailboat in uh, the summer, spring of 2010. I, I had been a gopher up until then. I, I, had, I had met him about four, four years before that. Um, he tried to learn how to golf, but uh, you don't learn how to golf as a 57-year-old man. <laughs> so, I threw the golf club in the garbage. In 2010, but he had always wanted to sail. So uh, he takes me up to this uh, uh, sailboat that was uh, uh, a big four sail sign along uh, the, the highway up to Gimli and says, what do you think? I said, what do you mean? What do I think about what? He says, well, I, I'm thinking of buying this sailboat. And I said, well, I've never sailed in my life, but I'd be willing to give it a try. So we bought the sailboat. He took sailing lessons that, that year from the local sailing club. Okay. Uh, he, he taught me how to sail, and we started sailing summer of 2010. Mm. April of 2011, he got his Parkinson's diagnosis. The doctor actually told him he should give up sailing. He said, no, I'm not doing that. And so we sailed Lake Winnipeg uh, for eight, eight years. Uh, went as far as we could, a lot farther than most people with without Parkinson's disease. And then that's when, uh, when he figured we'd done everything that we could on Lake Winnipeg. That's when he got this idea. Well, let's sail the Great Lakes. <laughs> well, you truck your boat over to the Great Lakes. Exactly. We uh, we trucked our boat from Gimli down to Duluth. Okay. Uh, with to, uh, we had we had our truck and we had friends come down because we had to uh, everything uh, had, the trailer and everything had to be taken back. Uh, so uh, we we trucked uh, down to Duluth and set off. Uh, did Lake Superior from Duluth down to Sault Ste. Marie okay. and then uh, did Lake Huron from Sault Ste. Marie to Sarnia. That was the summer of 2018. Came back uh, that winter, uh, and then in the summer of uh, 2019, we drove back to Su to Sarnia, which is where we had left the boat, and uh, sailed the summer of 2019 from Sarnia down. Uh, what's the what's the lake? The down the Detroit River to uh, Lake Erie, past uh, Pelee Island, which is a uh, <laughs> great winery and <laughs> Pelee yeah. Island winery. Uh, down to Erie, Pennsylvania, and then uh, back up through the Welland Canal. Uh, and then we did uh, Lake Ontario from uh, St. Catharines to Toronto and all the way up to the mouth of the St. Lawrence. Oh. And then back to Whitby and <laughs> left. Thousand Islands. <laughs> yeah, and to the Thousand Islands, right. So it was quite an adventure but uh, as uh, as we found uh, then 2020 you couldn't even if you recall you couldn't you couldn't cross the border uh, into Ontario because that was the the first year uh, of the pandemic so um, we couldn't go back and we had we learned that the uh, the marina in Ontario like most of the marinas, here in Manitoba were closed, we couldn't have been there anyway. And that's when Steve's Parkinson's started to uh, advance and so decided to sell Did the you boat. do Lake of the Woods? Uh, no. In a power road. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good way. <laughs> Lake of the Woods is a great boat for power boat. It's a very um, sh shallow and rocky boat. So uh, sailing on it is yeah. A little different. For sure. Good. An <laughs> the purpose of the book is to fundraise for Parkinson's research. Mm -hmm. There's no, uh, there's no cause. There's no, no, there's no known cause, and therefore there's no known cure. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really, we really want to thank you all. We're 
we're overwhelmed. Uh, we want to thank you all for coming out and thank you for your support of, of our book, of our adventure, and of uh, Parkinson Canada Research. So thank you very much. Is this Where's the sign?